So if it's a stage one, and um, and and we determine that um, that we can do a lumpectomy, yeah, we, we would do it. If it's a stage three, and we can bring that patient to a stage one or yeah. two, we will do that. We do neoadjuvancy either with chemo or with hormone therapy, depending yeah. on the on the chemo. Yeah. And so our aim is to get them to a curable stage. And what's your feeling about then? In triple negatives, for instance, or yeah. double negatives, we can use chemotherapy as well. And radiotherapy? And uh, radiotherapy is, is, I'm not very convinced that, you know, the, the, the chances of recurrence, or the possibility of recurrence, 18 to 20. And uh, radiation therapy may reduce that to about 15 12 percent, mm -hmm. and, and I, I think it's the gain is is not sufficient. So I rather, if it's a hormone dependent uh, chemo surgery, mm -hmm. and, and follow with hormone blocking. Mm -hmm. If it's not a, a hormone dependent uh, tumor, follow up with mm -hmm. diet, uh, MRI sometimes uh, because insurance will not pay for. And uh, if there's a recurrence, then do more surgery. But if it's an aggressive uh, or a higher grade, then you'd follow up with adjuvant chemotherapy yes. as well. Yes. Especially if hormones aren't. Yes. Okay. And and would that be the standard kind of uh, Basically, yes, it will be. There's other factors, but in general, yes, that would be approved. And and then if you are going to offer chemotherapy, um, you mentioned that there's the preconditioning phase. Would you? Yes. We, we always do that, and that way um, we can do less chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Shorter and or for fewer a shorter, cycles? Yes, <clears throat> and fewer cycles. So and what would preconditioning involve? The preconditioning, the preconditioning is basically the uh, ozone therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, for because, everybody? Yes. Uh, that's for any type of oxygen therapy. Mm -hmm. So vitamin Z is an oxygen yeah. therapy. <clears throat> for any type of oxygen yes. for chemo. And, uh, and, and, and the preconditioning also has its own anti-tumor effect. Okay. Um, and uh, then the anti-tumor agents will be vaginal or long-term vaginal, lateral or vitamin C. Agents. And you'd give a pa the patient a choice about that? Or would it, would it, it, it will depend. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the patients always make the choice. But it will depend also on the type of tumor. Sarcomas, for instance, mm -hmm. is really a waste of time to give it. Mm -hmm. has very little or no effect or if if we have a high grade a very poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma the colon if it is going very fast we need to we need to stop tumor growth before we can then plan on a long term therapy right so if we uh, in any patient our aim first is to stabilize the tumor or to reduce tumor as much as possible in in the lab our long-term survival mm -hmm. are the ones that after we achieve that, conventional or a combination of alternative, then only the alternative therapies will will be very effective for the long term. And, and so that's something that a lot of people don't, don't understand. Uh, so they believe that alternative therapy can solve all of the problems in all of in all types of tumors. That's not true. I often, because people are, are, are hesitating about uh, about what the chemotherapy likely to achieve, I often talk about maybe sending off half of the opposing football team, and giving giving the body a, a, it, it's, a better it's a good, chance. To yes, kind of what, what I told you is similar to that is just the leveling the playing yeah, field. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> you know, if, if the tumor is, is way ahead of us, we need to put stumbling blocks. Yeah. <clears throat> so and once you up. then once you catch up, then alternatives and natural elements have a chance. Yeah. And so, so you yes. talked about the sort of physical aspect of the ozone um, as a part of the preconditioning. Yeah. Do you also use many, many uh, acetylene nutraceuticals and supplements that, that we use as uh, transduction signaling elements. And will those go through chemotherapy as well? Or yes, do you normally okay. always. And uh, have you got convincing enough evidence that they don't interfere with metabolism? Completely. And there's a, there's a number of publications right. that they... You know, the, the, the oxidative effect of most chemists is so massive that no amount of antioxidants is really going to interfere with that. And they will help to, to reduce the side effects. 
And ozone, for instance, a big part of the preconditioning with ozone is that it, 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 it just increases tremendously the, the, the production of uh, glutathione, our mm-hmm. own production of antioxidating agents that when you onslaught, you know, the onslaught comes about with the chemo, then the patient, you know, will have more uh, 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 resources to, to be able to face that yeah. in a physical way. Yeah. So that's, you, that's basically why we do Do you do any fasting before chemotherapy? Because there's some interesting uh, research the, the, about Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of research that, uh, also with vitamin C, mm-hmm. that um, we did a very interesting study with... Fasting before vitamin C? You with mean, fasting, or? yes. Right. The same as right. chemo. Because it basically, you know, Active at high dosages, it works like distress, that. Yeah. And we did, um, in combination with uh, a ketogenic diet, we, we were disappointed. Mm-hmm. I, I was sure that that was going to make a big difference, and it didn't. Right. Uh, so there must be a... The, the malignant cells have a fast track and, and, and preference to whatever carbohydrates they are. Yeah. And, and, and so we haven't found a way to, to block that. So we had patients fasting for 21 days, C days. Right. And our results did not improve. Right. I, I was quite compelled by the kind of short fast before chemotherapy, um, putting non-cancer cells in a sort of you know, resting state or a sleep state. Yeah, where well, less susceptible rather than effects. that is, is actually stressing them them more, but um, our, 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 yeah. our study didn't show that, right. and I was I was surprised. Right. It, it 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 just didn't make any sense that it didn't make a difference. Yeah, but, but it, it didn't. didn't. And you know, I, I know that you put up the slide about the holistic approach. So as part of your preconditioning as well, you can focus on the physical sides of things. But what do you do well, the for emotional, emotional, psychological? We and do a lot, and, we, and, and in fact, uh, I would attribute a big chunk of our, our, our success uh, to the fact that uh, we provide um, tremendous resources emotionally and spiritually to our patients mm-hmm. uh, because we, we, we do not give credit enough in medicine to the power of the mind. And I think that you know, psychoneuro, uh, endocrinoimmunology is a major, major part if you want to have success. And, and so when a people, when a, when a patient decides that there's nothing to do, there's nothing yeah. to do. And I think that's the same, you know, you presented your statistics compared with MTI, MTI data, and I, I, our center is similar, that people choose to come to us. It's not a randomized yes. decision. So in a sense, the, the criticism has always been that if you get better survival rights, it's because people are already in that empowered um, sort of yeah, like well, self. why don't you take advantage of it <laughs> Exactly, then? exactly. But you can't say it's necessarily your intervention. The fact of, of seeking you out that is, is absolutely a, is a true. major part of it. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Now, but there are patients that are brought. Yes. Yes. And, and if you still, can turn them around, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So one of the things that we work is in reframing yes. them, uh, you know, from being a victim, a victim mm-hmm. to a victim. Yeah. And it works. And, and, and so we've been criticized forever of selling false hope. So my position is, well, it's true hope, you're dead. <laughs> There's, uh, so, well, have you come across a book called Radical Remission by Kelly Turner? No. She's, she's um, another one of these uh, sort of so qualitative researcher of people who have made you know, remarkable survivals, either where conventional medicine has been written off as, as unsuccessful or chosen not to. And she talks about taking control of health and, and the medical profession's fear of, of raising false hope. And she said, well, false hope is the hope of something that is not true, but these radical remissions do happen. They are true stories of people doing yes, extremely well. But, so but, actually... but, but, but it's also very subjective because uh, uh, let me tell you what uh, two examples that, that, that prove my point. You may be tumor-free and still a victim of cancer. Absolutely. You've gained really nothing. Yeah. Th- that's when the rate of recurrence is so high. Yeah. And you can be riddled with cancer and be completely in victory. How? I've had patients tell me cancer is the best thing that ever yeah. happened to me. Yeah. And, and people who are dying who say, I've never felt more alive at some point, you know, in, in some way. Absolutely. And, and so I think you have to if have... they die, 
were they victims or victors? Yeah. They were. They died in victory. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to die. So it, it is very subjective, but extremely powerful on a personal basis for you to convert yourself mentally into a victor. Yeah. And whether you survive longer or not, it, it's really besides the point. How we measure that, it's yeah. impossible. And do you have, I mean, because we're very good at measuring, you know, radiological response, biochemical response, yes. things. do you have any measures that you feel you can use to help people feel convinced about the fact that even though their cancer isn't shrinking, they are getting weller, if you see what I mean, in that, in that real holistic sense? There, there's, there's only two ways uh, to do that. It's just quality of life. Ask them how they feel. Yeah, because we have patients that, you know, were told you're, you're going to die in three months. And 20 years later, they're still alive, and the x-rays are unchanged. Uh, so if you are able to, to stabilize tumor growth with quality of life, you're successful. If you stabilize tumor without quality of life, then the patients, the point, yes. <laughs> the, the patients will want to die. Yeah. So you haven't found any physiological or other markers. You're talking about surrogate markers, but surrogate markers of health, in a sense, you know, people looking at cortisol profiles, people are looking at prostaglandins in the urine as a marker of anti-inflammatory status or anything. There's just, just ask all them of how those, they feel. All of those things are, are measurable. Yeah. But, but lastly, if the, if, if, if the patient on a very practical uh, way is not able to do things that make his life enjoyable yeah. or her life enjoyable, to them is of no... So let me challenge you with a, a scenario that we've had recently um, where a woman um, felt a lump, was, um, went for a mammography investigation, it was DCIS, and she elected not to have conventional treatment. She really mm -hmm. felt that her calling was to treat it unconventionally, and yeah. she had mistletoe injections, she radically overheld all, all her diet. Really, I, I think for a, you know, about a year and a quarter, felt that she was on a very successful path, her quality of life, her energy was improving. Mm -hmm. And she was then followed up with a follow-up mammogram, and for various reasons, it, she wasn't followed up before. before right, and we, we have the ethical, we have the, uh, uh, the scientific, and we have the environmental, all, all of the uh, committees that have to be, so we have all of that. In, in, um, and with your patients, because so much of It's with our patients. But every, randomization every. is, Inherently, a kind of anti-patient It is anti -patient very choice, difficult. So. Uh, uh, yes. And, and the fact is that most of the patients that will go into our trials are the ones that didn't respond well to whatever we right. did. Uh, so in that sense, is not, is not as kosher mm -hmm. as it should be. But, but still, you know, when you get a group of patients, the, 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 the result is going to be compelling. Mm -hmm. Compelling at least enough for us to continue doing it or mm -hmm. not. And we're very honest mm -hmm. about it about our results. As I was telling you, I was disappointed by very disease. disappointed yeah. by the ketogenic uh, effect because I really thought that that was going to be a big thing. Mm. It didn't. So now I talk after the fact of, of, of the Warburg effect, mm -hmm. which I'm completely sold into it, but I wasn't able to prove it, mm. period. Right. And that's life. And that's interesting, isn't it? And how do you, you know, how do you respond to something like this? Well, Obviously, I respond by saying I did it, yeah. and it didn't work. Yeah. I'm sorry to say, because I was, I was, um, I was so sure we've been working on that for, for so many years, but I, I wasn't able to do it. Uh, we're looking into the design, we're looking into everything, yeah. you know, because that, sometimes that's where you make yeah. mistakes. Yes, yeah. and patient selection as well, I think, sometimes. Uh, yes, uh, so there's, there's a number of factors, yeah. but, but we've done this long enough yeah. for us to know that, that it was disappointing. Right. Um, what about, um, you know, again, sort of big subject change, what about thermography? You've mentioned MRI and ultrasound. As a sort of I am what, not, what? I am not sold on thermography because the interpretation is still very subjective. Otherwise, I, we would recommend mm -hmm. it. But for the moment, there are many new diagnostic things with uh, electromagnetic fields and, and, and emotional things that, that we will, uh, you know, we have some of them available, but we don't, we don't rely on them. So would that kind of encompass some of the 
I don't know whether you're alluding to things like kinesiology or yes. some of the other things. Yes. So you would take a steer from some of those things, but no, no. no, we, no. We, you know, for instance, we have several of them, right? Uh, but we we do not count those as objective responses, right? Because there's they are so subjective and they're so personally personality dependent on who does it. Yeah. That uh, there's no way to you know, put them into into the context of, of objective evaluation. Yeah. So when you say so, I'm not saying that they have no value. Yeah. But but they have very um, they have very limited value as far as an objective evaluation. Yeah. I, I, I would say that. But you don't employ that kind of diagnostician, or you don't. I'm we right. have you, you, we have somebody of, do it. Right. But you know. We, we take it into consideration. Yeah, yeah, okay. we, we talk about it. Yeah. But I don't rely completely right. on it. Okay. And yes, and where it would conflict with something. So the kinesiologist says you've definitely got cancer, and uh, and, uh, and the pathologist says so no, you don't. don't. So then. Period. And, 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 <laughs> and, and how do you help the patient make sense of that? Or it, it sometimes it's, it's difficult, uh, but especially when when the diagnosis is of cancer and there's no objective way. Oh, then you will get it. So I, that's terrible <laughs> to put a patient in that condition. Or the other one, you know, uh, uh, according to this little machine, uh, you're not going to respond to vitamin C. Mm. <laughs> or, you know, so many times, it, it, but there, there's other tests that, that should be very, like genetic testing. Yeah, like the chemosensitivity Well, the chem chemosensitivity, and they don't work either. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm as critical on both sides. And and as wait. long as it's practical yeah. and I can repeat it, yeah. then I will rely yeah. on it yeah. as far as making a decision. If it's going to help the patient feel better, everything that does, I will do it. And that's what we have. Yeah. Um, um, so still, I'm, I want to be very objective. Mm -hmm. with, with what I do. Anything else you want to ask? Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, I have got a sort of um, personal interest in the thyroid gland. Yes. Um, and uh, I've been studying with some American doctors at the National Academy of Hypothyroidism, NA Hypothyroidism. And they are suggesting that uh, TSH and T4 uh, are not reliable in indices of thyroid function and that you have to look at T3, which is active thyroid hormone. And in fact, you have to look at the ratio between reverse T3 and free T3 and you need an adequate level of free D3 and a healthy ratio with reverse D3 in order to obtain optimal thyroid function. And I even think that what they're saying makes incredible sense that most people, when they've got chronic disease, um, when the immune system is failing to deal with the situation, it's normalizing and opt optimizing the thyroid function is, is key and fundamental. I think um, you're right, you know, the, the thyroid is really the one that has a brains uh, for every other uh, gland uh, function. And we continue to do a thyroid panel, but again, on the objective and the practical, you know, we, we haven't seen a difference in response, especially in cancer patients. We went to the point of not believing uh, thyroid testing because it's so subjective, it's one of the very subjective elements. And we went to temperature and to many other ways of, of really trying to find out thyroid function. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so when we optimized that, we didn't see any better results than the ones that when we didn't optimize them. So I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, sufficiently, sufficiently um, an expert on, on that area. But as I tell you, from a practical point of view, to me it made a lot of sense. And this was years ago. I can tell you when, when we did that, that study, that comparison. Uh, and it was, the information was compelling enough for me to say, well, if, if, if I can improve thyroid function, then the rest of the therapy should work better. It just sounded logical. Uh, so we did it, and we didn't see. Maybe we didn't really improve it. Yeah. Because the measuring tools are, 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 are not there for us to... Maybe they weren't there now, but there's a lot of... Research. There, there's, a lot of there's a lot of new things now, and you're right. And I, I, it, It's good that you mentioned it. I'll look into it again. We, we did it 
very, uh, very uh, 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 diligently, because I, I truly believe in, in the uh, hormonal aspect of balance. But uh, as I tell you, in, in the people that we thought we had better or improved or good balance uh, of thyroid uh, function, did not respond any better than the ones that yeah. supposedly did not have it. It's interesting because you offer, I mean, uh, it is back to this sort of synergistic approach, isn't it? And, you know, we're hypothesizing about what's the key kind of modulator because presumably, you know, if you're looking for the one central gate to kind of health, then, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe there isn't one and maybe you can have. Yeah. I've, 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 never, I've never been a fan of evolution, but when I look into these things, it's like, how can you believe in evolution? It's just so complicated. <laughs> Everything is so complicated that it's just, you know, it's just impossible that <laughs> we just happened by chance and came from the monkeys. It's, it's just not possible. Th thinking about the synergistic approach, I just, I, I wonder whether, it, do you feel that there's a standard program that most people should be encouraged to kind of, t on, their, on their list of things that, that we do? Or uh, is yes, it, for cancer patients? Yeah. Yes. We have a very standardized uh, protocol for home therapy. Right. Uh, obviously, you know, every, every patient is going to respond differently, but they are, they're, it's, it's based on a, on a very profound scientific uh, basis. Do you get all a of sense the things that, that we that, that we give our patients to go home right with. and do you get a sense that it, sometimes i feel that you know this person's greatest area in need of healing is in the psychological domain or in the emotional domain you don't tailor your treatment you'll you focus on everything on, but on, try on, to... on the on the very on the very physical aspect it, it really shouldn't matter right uh, that the response is going to be better if if they are mentally and, and, and spiritually into it, there's no question. Yeah. But again, that is. But I suppose I think yeah. sometimes whatever you're doing physically, that's not the cause. You know, that that's not where your your main, you know, pathology, if you like to call it that, or whatever. Very is. true. I did so, a, a. But maybe it helps to believe in or helps to have that structure. And, and I'm going to have to to go, but I'll, I'll finish with this. I did a, a review of, I think it was 22 clinical trials that we've done over the years. And uh, I, I wanted to find a common denominator on the long-term survivors because the, the, there was a you know a variation of the protocols uh, that, that was wide. Mm -hmm. And the common denominator of the long-term survivors were the ones that kept their diet. Mm -hmm. And well, diet. There's no question. We all believe that diet is important. But that important, mm -hmm. important, and there's no way of proving it. Mm -hmm. But what my sense is that people that keep their diet at least three times a day, they're giving a very strong message to their body that they care. I am sacrificing for you. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to measure, but that's my only explanation. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, you know, they have a program, it's based on whatever, but the messaging yeah. is, is, is extremely powerful. There's no way to measure that. And I think, you know, that comes across in some of these studies where they've looked at remarkable survivors, and some of them have been doing very different things, but they've been doing yeah. something. And you have there. remarkable survivors yeah. that are optimists, and you have remarkable, there are yeah. pessimists. Yeah. But that's, you see, that... that that's the way they're wired. That's a, it, you know, a pessimist doesn't mean that he cannot be uh, uh, optimist about his future. He just looks at it in a very different way. Um, so those reactions are very different. I, I think that a lot of it is a messaging. So I tell my patients that mixed messages to yourself are very bad. Mm. A mixed message would be, well, you know, I'm, I, I came to Mexico, I'm doing everything very good, but you continue smoking. So your body is, is, is saying, well, what is it? Do you want to heal me or do you want to kill me? In, in, in mixed messages as in relationships are bad mm -hmm. within yourself are very bad um, so we work a lot with our patients on that on that mm -hmm. end, on that part yeah the, the messaging. getting behind the kind of yes yeah getting with themselves there's a percentage of patients that whatever you do mm -hmm. they're gonna die yeah and and, and the percentage is it's not small 
So treating 100% of the patients because of that, I think it's unfair. Uh, and, and, and so we all have cases like that. You know, where apparently it shouldn't have been a problem, but it was. Um, and do you think what do you do? Yeah. I, I think that, you know, unfortunately, is the cost is always mm -hmm. a, a terrible factor. Uh, but as with that study with the BRCA uh, uh, patients, uh, was for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in about, I think it was four of the nine, finally tumors were detected mm -hmm. and removed. Yeah. Not the breast. Just the tumor, and yeah. They, and they still survived. Uh, so in, in cases like that of a, a DCIS, generally, in about 75% of the cases, they'll never cause problems. Mm. Uh, do I recommend that those people follow up with, um, uh, even with a, a uh, mammography, yes, because mm -hmm. they're at a higher risk. So there you're not just screening. Yes. There you already found something. Yeah. So it's a diagnostic. Uh, sonography has improved so much nowadays that I wouldn't feel uncomfortable in, let's say, doing maybe uh, uh, two sonograms a year mm -hmm. and maybe one mammogram if the sonogram shows any red flags. So, yes, you need to follow it. But to mutilate so many or to overtreat a hundred percent of the patients with DCIS, yeah, to me, it's not the answer. But it's and again, I think that's one thing where you get the best of both worlds in a sense because her, in, in this case, her quality of life, she really, really did feel like she was doing well and yes. that, the, that her yes. chosen path was working. Yeah, for it's, her. it's unfortunate. You will have a health nut that you know dropped dead from a heart attack <laughs> at forty. Yeah, that shouldn't have happened. Yeah, but it happens. Or you have them, the George Burnses. Yeah. They smoke, they drink, they, they stab themselves and they don't die. <laughs> it's, that's life. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, so maybe then asking about something, well, it, it's interesting asking about something like DCIS, where mm -hmm. what would your approach be to something like that, which is, as you say, personally? I, I, would, I would still uh, not treat. A DCIS. Would you precondition them and do the, the rest of it? No, sort of, I, of, of course, if you want to uh, prevent, really prevent, because it's a DCIS, and then uh, what this lady did and, and do all of that, yes, mm -hmm. I think it would be very, very helpful. Uh, but in those cases, there, there's going to be a percentage mm -hmm. that are going to turn into a very aggressive, very aggressive cancer. So tell you, the percentage is so low that I don't feel that we need to treat on, like, like the 641. You know, you avoided two deaths, and 641 women were mutilated. But again, I think it's personal choice, and some people would rather do that and feel that yeah. that's safe. That uh, but as I tell you, it's, it, usually they're compelled to do that because information is given in such a way that, it, that it's misleading yeah. when there are options. Yeah. And again, what are you going to do in areas that you cannot remove? Yeah. Or do, do you really think that if, if we would find uh, testicular cancer uh, genes that a bunch of men would, <laughs> would remove their testicles? They wouldn't. I mean, we would, I, I'd rather live five years less. Yeah. It's so the, the information is not totally given. It's not totally given. Uh, oh, it's 90% effective. Yeah. I'll do the it. Percentages are always For what? Very misleading. You need the absolute numbers, don't you? How yes. many people? And as and, you say, and, the absolute. And, Absolute and death rates because you can get. I, yeah, if, I think that if you if you give the information completely, mm -hmm. and somebody still says, "Oh, well, I'm so afraid," because it's really fear. And and one of the things that we work a lot with our patients is about it's fear. Yeah. And fear to what? Is, isn't that interesting? You knew that. I mean, we the three of us know that we're going to die, right? So dying is nothing new. The problem is a date. Yeah, and also dying in pain and, and suffering. I think there's a lot well, of people who are frightened of that. Most of us know that we're going to die in suffering mm -hmm. and in pain. It's that that's not new information. Yeah. The problem, what changes are dates. Yeah. And, 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 and then the second thing is, as we approach death, age-wise or because of disease, is what's going to happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous amount of fear. So. I'm not worried when I'm 50, I'm combing myself, what's going to happen to me if I die, and after I die, 
30 years from now. I'll worry later. Mm -hmm. But now I've been told that I'm going to die in six months. Wow. Now I'm an atheist and I'm thinking about, wow, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> and all of those things. So, so you know, uh, your, your emotional reaction is going to be based on your spiritual fortitude. Yeah. And, and your culture's notion of death and notion of... And, and so once you are able to help somebody resolve that issue, the fear factor drops tremendously. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that I tell my patients is you have to come to the point where you feel so comfortable about, about, about eternity, regardless of your system of belief, mm -hmm. where you would say, like Eleanor Roosevelt said, yesterday is gone, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it present. If you're not going to enjoy the day, nobody knows that if, if we're going to be alive tomorrow. Mm. Right? I can go out here and be run over by a truck because I look the other way. And I won't be here tomorrow. I don't have to have cancer mm. or heart disease or anything to be dead tomorrow. So is that something that you standardly would just talk about with to all, all of, all of yeah. the patients? To all you of the patients. You assess their yes. fear and you assess and their... That and that is really what starts changing. Mm -hmm. this point. Because really, it's, it's, it's not dying, it's how sure you are that you are going to leave to a better place. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I sometimes get the feeling that, as you say, that's what really starts to change things. And that what hooks people in is the ozone or the nutraceutical. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the physical and part is, is, is important. Because it's tangible. Yeah. And so one of the things that I tell the patients is that, you know, in, in, in the many phases that we go in, into death and dying is, um, is uh, well, the first one is denial. The, the, the four major ones, denial, anger, you know, the why me phase. But the third phase is negotiation. Mm -hmm. and, and that part is so important because it's, it's, it's the tangible one. Mm -hmm. So I was told that I'm going to die in a year. I want to negotiate that. What if I die in two years? What if I die in 10 years? What do I have to do? So these are the things. Mm -hmm. And so also, that's a list. So I, I did, you know, check, check, check. That, that, it's a very important part of, to do things that are very tangible. Yeah. And, and then the fourth part, uh, the, the, the fourth phase is basically putting cancer on the back seat, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to do. A cancer patient gets an ingrown toenail and says, oh my God, now the cancer is in my toe. Uh, everything is about the cancer. So once you say, you know, uh, I have cancer, it's me. I'm doing everything that I can. I'm just going to put cancer on the back seat and I'm, I'm, I'm going to enjoy life. And, and so the negotiating part is very important because is when you can say, I'm doing everything I can. that I can. I'm being responsible. But that can you, people can really get stuck in that phase, can't they? And there can yes, always be something can, else yes. that you and can do. And they can, they can they, never let go. Yeah. And there's always another and, bit of internet research that somebody's done or that. Yes. And how do you help people transition into that backseat um, place? Because we had a lovely lady who said, you know, I've really got to the stage where I'm not living with cancer, it's living with me. And mm -hmm. that's that kind of, it's on the backseat, this is my life. And I just thought, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, you know, people can go in and out mm -hmm. depending on the results. Yeah. Uh, if the tumor is progressing, you know, well, what else yeah. on my checklist can yeah. I? And, and, and so we're always looking for new things and adjusting the therapy for, yeah. for the patients. How long do they tend to sort of, what, what's the trajectory? Generally, it's about three, three weeks on the initial. And they're and staying with you then? On, yes. Yeah. And then depending on the results, uh, we will bring them back. Uh, Usually, all of them will, will bring them back for an evaluation six to eight weeks, uh, where objectively we determine if, if the therapy is the correct one or not. So, do they, I mean, uh, most cancer programs are obviously a lot longer than that. So, yes, they, well, then the, the, then, then, the second, to... yeah, then the second, you know, the, virtually the third visit, it, it will depend on results as well right. and on aggressivity. So, some patients will have to come like 
you know, cycles of chemotherapy for several months. And uh, if a patient is doing well, then, you know, we'll say three months, six months, or a year. So for most depending. people, do they get their kind of three weekly cycles or whatever? At three weeks at, at our place, and right. then we, we send them with home therapy, and then they come back for a second visit for sure. Right. And then maybe a third or a fourth visit in, in the short uh, uh, future. Uh, and, and again, depending on the, the aggressivity of the tumor and response, we'll, we'll prolong those visits. Mm -hmm. And um, just a couple of practical questions, on, more on that shopping list. What's your take on hypothermia? Um, hypothermia um, yeah. Uh, hypothermia? Not, yeah. We, hypothermia? we did a, a, a very interesting clinical trial about 10 years ago, and we found that in order for it to be effective, and it is quite effective, you need to break the 42 degree barrier. Right. You need to treat them for it. You need to treat the patient for at least four hours. Mm -hmm. And then you need another two hours cooling down. Right. At that time, we needed to have the patient really anesthetized. Right. There was no, no way. And it was very effective. But the criteria of exclusion was so high, and, and the whole process was so expensive that we stopped doing it. We are starting, we are starting uh, probably in two months, a new protocol because with the advent of uh, sedation, I truly believe that that we're going to be able to treat a lot more patients. Right. And, um, but the results were very complete. Mm -hmm. It's just that it, it was so harsh that very few people well, were candidates. 